You may notice this morning that I've turned the chairs instead of slanting towards this way. I've faced the entire congregation, and so it's facing everyone now. And so it seems like as if I am meeting you guys for the first time on this left side of the church. So seeing your faces for the first time. So good to see you. Um, also, it takes away your ability to sneak in to the side in case you're late, because now I can see you on the side there when you're coming in. So um, last night at the five o'clock mass, um, Deacon Dwight shared with me that he was at the exact place where Jesus was on his uh, Holy Land pilgrimage at uh, Caesarea Philippi. He mentioned that there were some huge cliffs on that side there. A lot of greenery, that's where the Jordan begins on the north side of the Lake of Galilee. And so very nice place. And so happens to be where Jesus asked this question of his disciples. And I was thinking, you know, the gospel of Mark, St. Mark uses very few words. Matter of fact, it's the shortest gospel of all the gospels. And so every word he puts in there has some meaning. He doesn't just you know, give us a location by accident, right? And so Caesarea Philippi is also the place where the Romans carve out these gods on the side of the mountain. These cliffs of rocks have different gods, you know, and then the Greeks as well. And so it's all there. And so it is there that Jesus poses the question, who do you say that I am? Am I one of these gods up here? Am I just a god? Am I just a prophet? Am I just a wise person? Or am I just a crazy person thinking that he is a man God? Who do you say that I am? Or who do you people say that I am first, right? And then he turns around and asks his closest disciples, those who are actually following him, perhaps leaving their well-being behind, their family behind, their career behind, to follow the Lord. So he's posing this question on them, but who do you say that I am? Because before you invest everything into following me, it's good to be clear on who you're following. So by God's grace, Peter has the correct confession, the confession that the entire church rests on, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He doesn't go that far just yet. He just says that you are the Christ. And so the Christ means that he is the anointed one. That's what Christos means in Greek. Or in Hebrew, it's Mashiach or Messiah. So it's Jesus, Christ, the anointed one. So Christ is not his last name, just in case, you know, we're wondering about that. Some people thought this was his last name, Jesus Christ, but Christ means is his title. So St. Peter, knowing the scriptures, perhaps was aware that the Messiah was coming. The Israelites were expecting this son of David who will one, who will one day come and become the king of Israel and of all the nations, the Messiah. Kings at that, in those days were considered sons of God. And so son of God, just as an as a earthly title for a king, but the most importantly, a powerful Messiah to rule the world. An Israelite, a powerful king. So this was the image that the entire people was expecting, and Peter made that confession. Little does he know what this Messiah, this Jesus, entails. All he sees is an earthly king, a political king, powerful enough perhaps to wipe out the Romans, right? who was occupying the people at that time. And so Jesus, we hear, began to teach them, instruct them on what this Messiah, Jesus himself, will do. Not to wipe out governments or powers of the earth, but to eliminate evil and sin and death. That's the goal of Jesus. That's the entire reason why he came down from heaven in the first place. Right? And so, can you imagine just the disciples like, what is Jesus talking about? How is this Jesus gonna do that? 
So he instructs them. And you can tell they're completely ignorant of what Jesus just told them. And next week you'll get evidence of that. And so this, um, and so he, he goes further about you know, how this Messiah has, has to suffer and die and rise. And then that you must you know, carry this cross behind this Messiah. The concept is absolutely lost on Peter and the apostles. Because here is this Messiah, this king, that's supposed to rule the entire world with power, with glory, with fame. And yet here is this opposite spectrum of that is this cross, because the cross is the most humiliating, humiliating way to die, the most horrible death that you could experience in those days. The Romans reserved the cross for the worst criminals. Even the Romans don't speak about the cross. They know it's there to prevent the worst crimes. The people know it's there. So it's there as a guarantee that you don't commit serious crimes against the Romans. This is where the condemned have to carry his own instrument of death to the place of execution. It's sort of like dragging your own electric chair to the power plant or mixing your own injection I thought about this morning that that is death, not only physical death, but interior death. That you actually are the cause of your own death, right? You're carrying your own instrument of death. So you're dead inside your soul <laughs> and of course in being crucified in, in, in front of everyone in public. That is a true death. That's why they don't talk about the cross. That's why it's lost on the apostles. But that's the extraordinary, the extraordinary mystery that God has planned for Jesus. And for those who will follow him. As if Jesus is drawing a line of sand, if you want to follow me, this is what it takes. Are you in or are you out? Are you gonna fish or are you gonna cut bait? So the readings all portray about this determination that this servant of God has in doing God's will. The first reading is about um, this servant of God, right? And he speaks. He speaks as if this is almost the words of Christ speaking here. I have not rebelled, I have not turned back. I gave my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who plucked my beard, my face I did not shield from buffets and spitting. He knows, Jesus knows exactly what's waiting for him in Jerusalem. Isaiah foreshadowed it, prophesied it. But there's confidence. The Lord God is my help. I'm not disgraced. I've set my face like flint, right? As if Jesus is stone-faced in doing God's will. He's determined, no matter what the cost is, He's determined to do God's will. And so there is some sequence, it sort of makes sense on the readings today, it's, it's extraordinary really, is that we sort of get a, a glimpse of the passion as that Jesus is thinking these thoughts in his heart. This is what's happening to him, that God has his back. Despite all these things, God has his back. See, the Lord God is my help who will prove me wrong. In the end, God has his vindication. And so he dies through this passion. And so the, the Psalm today actually carries us through the passion and death of Jesus. It says here, the cords of death encompass me. The snares of the netherworld seize upon me. I fell into distress and sorrow. I call upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, save my life. The cords of death. This is Jesus, Jesus experiencing death on our behalf. And so he calls out to the Lord, perhaps in the three days that he was among the dead, 
And so he calls out, and so the Lord answers his call. God is faithful. At the end of the psalm, as if Jesus once again is speaking, he has freed my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I shall walk before the Lord in the land of the living. The resurrection, the land of the living, that is no other place than heaven. This is the resurrection being foreshadowed, certainly for Jesus, but also our own personal re resurrection. Those who follow Christ in this way will certainly see the land of the living if we are determined to follow in his ways. St. James speak about actually demonstrating your faith. We can profess that we have faith all day long. I have saving faith all day long, but if you don't demonstrate your faith, as if, as if you're saying, well, I can fly. I can fly. But if I don't demonstrate my power to fly, no one's gonna believe me, right? That's demonstration that needs to happen. Perhaps that faith is, is that little light, that fire, that um, Jesus spoke about, about the 10 vir virgins you know, who had their, their lamps lit, but the oil has run out. The light of faith has to be kept alive by oil. And what is that oil? That is our lives demonstrating the faith. That is the works that keeps the flame of faith alive in our hearts. Perhaps the oil could be the sweat and tears and even blood that our life sometimes spills out for the sake of others, for the gospel. Just so happens that each of those elements, you know, the tears, the sweat and blood, all of it have a little bit of oil in, in, in them. So maybe Jesus is trying to get us to think about something here. Right? Are we using our oils? to keep the flame of faith alive in our hearts. The children need to, I guess, hear some of what I got to say here. So they're back. So this is pretty serious at this point. And then we have the confession of Peter, right? We know how the great abyss going from, you know, the Father has revealed this to you, and now Jesus is calling Peter, get behind me, Satan. You notice what Jesus does is he pull Peter's aside, right? He doesn't rebuke him in front of others. Sort of like the three steps and how we come to reconcile with others. If your brother sins against you, pull him aside. Jesus does what, he's, what he says. Pull Peter aside and says, get behind me, Satan. Reminds you of the story of this one one lady who um, bought a very expensive dress, very expensive. She uh, went home, showed to her husband. Her husband asked how much the, job, the, the, the dress cost. And sure enough, it was very expensive. The guy almost had a stroke, you know. And she says, well, I agree, it's very expensive, honey. But when I tried it on, I was so tempted just to get it. And the husband says, what you should have said was, get behind me, Satan. You know, and she said, well, that's exactly what I said. And so Satan told me, you look fabulous from back here too. <laughs> there goes that. <laughs> and on, on the serious note, of course, Peter doesn't, he's not aware of the scriptures, right? Maybe he is, maybe he's not but Isaiah should have given him a hint on what this Messiah should do. On the other side of the coin, Peter's rebuke of Jesus perhaps symbolizes our own unwillingness to carry the cross in our own lives. We don't want to talk about the cross. We don't want to talk about suffering and sacrifice. The silence of the apostles and of Peter just not wanting to deal with that perhaps symbolizes our own inclinations when it comes to the cross. 
but ironically, in a mysterious way, is exactly what gives life. That's the Lord's way. Every Eucharist, He dies and gives us life. Can we follow Him? Can we demonstrate our faith? May God bless us and keep us always in His care. Please like, subscribe, and comment below. God bless you.